Welcome to chapter 15, part four. So we're going to wrap up this little conversation um, on the, the next two slides discussing Proton and MR and strategy. And then the majority of this video, we will cover carbon and MR. I will make an additional video where I work through some practice problems. Um, and I welcome you to uh, come to office hours and we can work out more. Um, and just let me know what you guys need. Okay, so we've learned about all the things we can take from Proton and MR. We can figure out the types of hydrogen, right? The types of different chemical environments by the number of signals. The chemical shift can tell us about um, the chemical environment as well. Integration tells us how many hydrogen a signal represents. And then splitting gives us that super important structural information about the neighbors, right? So how is the actual backbone put together? Um, some things that you can use though uh, to identify between very similar compounds like our xylenes here, right? These are all dimethyl benzenes um, and the difference is just, right? They're constitutional isomers. It's just where the methyl groups are, one, two, one, three, or one, four. Um, they would give very similar um, results in IR. Um, they would have uh, similar physical properties, but NMR would make it very easy to distinguish because their symmetry is so different, right? If we're looking at the one, two, right, there is a line of symmetry we could draw here. So you have the methyls in the same chemical environment, right? It's got to be exactly the same what it's attached to, right? So when I go from this CH3, I have a, a carbon and a double bond with a carbon to a CH3 on this side, a, a CH on this side, and, and it's the same all the way around. So that symmetry here gives us one, two, three different signals. With the one, three you don't have the same type of symmetry, right? This hydrogen, you do still have some symmetry. That's why the methyl groups are the same and these blue hydrogens are the same. But this hydrogen in green is not the same as the one in yellow. It is right next door to the carbons with the methyl groups and the one in yellow is further away. They're not in exactly the same position. So you see four signals. With the 1,4 substitution, you get an extra plane of symmetry. So all of the hydrogens on the ring are in the identical locations. They're next to a carbon with a methyl. They're two away from a carbon with a methyl. They're in exactly the same environment all the way around. So you only have the methyl carbons and then those aromatic, I'm sorry, protons. Um, and so you wouldn't even really have to think about the pattern uh, to distinguish these, it would be two, three, or four signals. Now, when you are solving problems, Klein loves to, to give you some strategy. And this is really, um, it's personal, right? If you solve the problem and you go in a different order, then you still solve the problem, right? You still get the points. But sometimes, especially if you suffer from test anxiety, um, or just, you know, you're taking a summer class in, in a short period of time and you need someone to tell you your strategy, Klein likes to step in. I definitely agree. If you are solving for an unknown structure and you have a chemical formula, calculate the degree of unsaturation or HDI or IHD, whatever it's called. Um, this is going to act as sort of your inventory. If you have the chemical formula, you know how many atoms of each type and the degrees of unsaturation is also something to keep track of while you're building your structure, right? How many double bonds or rings or triple bonds are even allowed. And then you can match that up with things like chemical shifts or IR uh, peaks to find out large portions of your molecule. From there, start to consider those NMR signals and integrations. If you have a compound that has, and I think we saw an example of this in a previous video, 10 hydrogens, but the integrations come out to five, 
you know you have a high degree of, um, of symmetry, right? Uh, if all hydrogens are present and accounted for, you might not have that same type of symmetry. <clears throat> then you're going to go piece by piece. You're going to make mistakes. You've got to give yourself room for that. You are putting together a puzzle. So figure out the pieces that go together. Keep track of your inventory. And then once you have a lot of the pieces, start to put them together and <clears throat> analyze the structure you drew to see if it matches with the NMR that you're looking at. That is the type of thing that I will do in a practice video. Okay, so from there, let's talk about the last section in this chapter, uh, the last major section in this chapter about carbon NMR. Now, carbon NMR is more difficult on the experiment side because we have to focus on carbon-13. Carbon-12 doesn't have a magnetic moment, right? It's an even mass number. And so carbon-13 is what we are analyzing when we say carbon NMR, Proton NMR is so easy because the great, you know, majority of all hydrogen atoms are hydrogen um, and not deuterium or tritium. For carbon, right, 99% of all carbon is carbon-12. So you're really only analyzing 1% of all the carbon in your compound. So what does that look like experimentally? You either need more concentrated samples or you most frequently, just need to run lots and lots and lots of scans to average out. So the experiment itself can look, can take a little bit longer. Um, in proton NMR, uh, shift, splitting, and integration are important. In carbon NMR, the number of signals and the chemical shift will be most important. We will talk a little bit about splitting but you will not see any carbon NMRs with splitting. The reason for that, we're not worried about carbon splitting other carbon because the likelihood that you have two carbon-13 atoms in the same molecule and they're close enough to split each other is just is too small to care. It will get averaged out into the noise if it, if it does happen. So... We're not worried about that splitting. However, you've got protons everywhere and for most organic compounds, and the protons can affect the chemical environment of the carbon, just like they can affect each other and cause splitting with each other. Protons can cause splitting with carbon. And so if we're looking at a carbon, let's say even something as simple as just pentane, right? This carbon right here has two hydrogens on it that are close enough to split it. And then it's also going to be affected by all of these hydrogens. And this is really symmetrical. If you add asymmetry in there, that can be a whole nother mess, right? So you're talking about multiple levels of complex splitting. So what we are often given is a decoupled spectrum. I can't really explain how the experiment works and gives you this is probably something that happens in the computer and gives you this result but what it does is it eliminates the splitting all right so you don't see that multiplicity everything is a singlet right everything is a singlet so you're looking at the number of si signals the number of singlets that's going to be the number of types of carbon. Now with carbon, types of carbon, it's similar to types of protons. Um, they Carbons to be considered the same type of carbon would have to be in the exact same chemical environment. So we're talking about either, you know, CH3 is attached to the same carbon or high degrees of symmetry. If, uh, if you, you know, for say, for instance, if you have a C10 molecule, but you only see eight carbon peaks, well, then you know that some of there's at least a couple that are in the same chemical environment. All right, so axes of symmetry are, are going to be important. Now, when we talk about the x-axis, it is different. 
than that of, oh, here we go. It's right here. That of your proton in MR. It goes from zero to 200 or 220. But it is going to line up very similarly with proton and MR, and we'll, we'll talk about that when we get to chemical shift. Um, but don't be surprised, the PPM numbers are much higher. Right, oh, and so here's another example. Going back to the, to the dimethyl benzenes, we looked at this right a couple of slides ago, looking at the hydrogen. You can use carbon and MR to differentiate between even very similar compounds uh, if there is differences in the symmetry, right? Um, you've got four types of carbon here, the methyl groups, the carbons attached to the methyl groups, the CH2s on the outside and the CH2s on the, or sorry, the CHs and the C, CHs on the bottom. Uh, when you go to one to three, you have five signals and then one four with two planes of symmetry, you have three signals. Now, this is what I wanted to compare here. So actually, let's redraw it. We're going to draw the carbon NMR axis, X axis, and C in MR, 0 to 220 down here, versus 0 to something 10 or 12 for proton NMR. You're going to split up your carbon NMR into four pieces. Right, basically 0 to 50, 50 to 100, 100 to a 150, and then above 150. And I don't know why I put 2020. There we go. Now, at the, the far upfield region, this is where you're getting carbons with just single bonds around them. Just like in the proton NMR, you know, 0 to 2-ish is all just really standard organic pieces. Uh, no interesting uh, functional groups down here. Um, 50 to 100, you will see your carbon-carbon triple bonds. Um, we don't, they, those don't tend to have a lot of hydrogen on them, so you're not worried about those in carbon NMR. But let's start putting in our electronegative elements, CO, CN, uh, your halogens. Things like that are going to push carbon down just like they do in proton and MR to, you know, the three and four region. Uh, for carbon and MR, it's going to be 50 to 100. Now, in the 100 to 150 region, this is where you're getting carbon-carbon double bonds and aromatic groups, right? So that's kind of like your five to eight region. Um, your aromatics come around, you know, seven to eight, double bonds around four and a half to six. Uh, and so the carbon NMR, it's going to be 100 to 150. And then 10 and 12 on the proton NMR are hydrogens associated with carboxylic acids and aldehydes. And so any of your carbonyls are going to be up above 150 somewhere. I definitely recommend knowing those four sections. Um, almost the, I'm not going to say almost all, the great majority of practice problems, you will be able to solve a structure using the proton NMR, and then the carbon NMR can help you double check or help you if you get stuck. Um, but if I'm asking you a multiple choice question or you're trying to use just carbon NMR to distinguish between structures, knowing these ranges is super critical. All right, now that's it's pretty simple, right? You're going to see singlets. The singlets are going to tell you how many types of carbon there are and then where they fall on the x-axis gives you some information about their chemical environment and functional groups. Not nearly as powerful as proton NMR, one might say. Right, so something else that can be used is distortionless enhancement by polarization transfer carbon NMR. This is an experiment that starts to analyze carbon based on how many hydrogens are present. So there are two, there's more than two types, but there's two types that you need to know. You need to know about depth 90 and depth 
135. If you use decoupled depth 90 and depth 135, you will know if you have carbon, a CH, a CH2, or a CH3. So here it is um, kind of summarized in words. Depth 90 only CH signals appear. Um, and then depth 135, CH and CH3 appear. And CH2 gives a negative signal. Carbon without hydrogen does not appear. So let's, let me show you what you should focus on. This summary chart, All right? If you have a broadband decoupled spectra, you are going to get a singlet for every type of carbon. Depth 90, you will only get CHs. Depth 135, you get CH3s and CHs. So if you have both of them, you will know which of your signals are CH3s because they won't appear in the depth 90. You'll know which are CHs because they will only they, they will be the only thing that appears in the depth 90. CH2s are super easy because they're the only negative sign, negative signal that you will see uh, in any of your NMR experience in this class. And then you'll know if you have a carbon with no hydrogen because it'll be in the broadband decoupled spectrum, but it will be missing from the other two. So this can be pretty powerful in helping us um, decide between similar structures or to even help us put together compounds. Um, so what I would like to do is I would like for us to talk through um, a, a simple practice problem here. So what I'm going to do is, let's actually, I messed up. Let's put this here. And there we go. And let's compare to, right, two very similar isomers. There are three CH3s. There is a CH2 in both of them and a CH in both of them, All right? So when I look at decoupled, there's a couple of things here. And I'm going to focus on the 0 to 100 region because there's no reason anything should show up past 100. And we'll do the same thing over here. It'll just be a little bit smushed. There we go. Now... They, have, they each have one, two, three, and then four, right? Your CH3s are going to be identical. One, two, three, and then four. So they're each going to have four signals. Your, uh, let's see, let's go piece by piece here. Um, you're going to have two signals that are above 50 because you have two carbons that are attached to oxygen, and you're going to have two below 50 because your CH3 is out here and this CH3 are not attached to oxygen. In this one, you have two carbons that are attached to oxygen and two types of carbon that are not. You would not really be able to tell, especially because integration doesn't really work for carbon in MR. Uh, so you wouldn't be able to tell, you know, the identical CH3s. So you would need to use one of the depth spectra. So let's see if depth 90 helps us. Depth 90 tells us where the CHs are. And where are the CHs here? Well, you have a CH in this first example here, and that one's going to be above 50. Whereas the CH on this one is not directly attached to the oxygen, so it'll be below 50. Now, right there, depth 90 is all you would need to be able to tell the difference. But just because we just learned about it, let's also think about what it would look like in depth 135. Well, we know in this case we have a CH2 above 50, so we would have a negative signal, and a CH above 50, right? And that's the one you saw in the depth 90. The CH3s, right, the methyl on this side and these two methyls, would both be below 50. They'd both be positive, but you wouldn't have seen them in the 90. For the right-hand example, you would have your, uh, let's see, your CH3 that is attached to the oxygen, 
Um, it was not right there. What am I doing? There we go. Sorry. Your CH3 that's attached to the oxygen would be above 50. Your CH2 that's attached to the oxygen would also be above 50. Now, which one of these is further past 50? I, it, it doesn't matter. Um, you would have an up and a down above 50 in both of these. Then in the below 50, you would have your CH. That's the one that matches the 90 and your CH3s. So for this particular example, depth 90 is kind of the superstar. It's the one that would allow us to determine which isomer we had. Something that is not inclined that you need to know is uh, how this information could be given to you without showing you a spectra. So NMR data can be written out, and you're going to see this in lots of examples. Um, I, I, I will have lots of practice that we will go over in, in my practice video, but I want you to be prepared for how it looks. Oftentimes there's a little delta symbol just telling us, okay, we are, we're dealing with chemical shifts. Um, you're going to see uh, the nucleus. So it might be something like carbon-13 or H1, NMR. And then you're going to have data listed. You're typically going to, for NMR, sometimes it's really simple. It's just signal, 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 right? However many singlets there are, that's what you're going to see. If we're talking about proton NMR, you may see something like, okay, we have um, a signal at 7.2. And then in parentheses, you might see uh, five hydrogen. That's the integration. And maybe it's messy. It's a multiplet. And then down at, I, I don't know, let's say 2.0, you have um, one hydrogen and it is split into a quartet, right? And then at 1.2, you have three hydrogen, or let's say, I know. Let's make it make sense. Six hydrogen and it's split into a doublet, right? You don't have to see the NMR, but you have the NMR here. I'm not going to ask you to sketch the NMR, but you might to be able to figure a problem like that out. Um, I've made this up off the top of my head, but I'm pretty sure I know what this would, <laughs> would be here. Uh, if you had something at 7.2, all right, that's going to be a benzene ring. If there are five hydrogen, that means it's mono substituted. All right? And then if I have one hydrogen, that is, oh, this doesn't really make sense. Let's not try to make sense of the, the practice problem I made up on the spot. But that's how you would start to break it down. And the reason I wanted to get into this here is because for the carbon-13 NMR, even though Klein doesn't mention it, you're often going to see splitting information. And I want you to understand what it means. So if I see something like uh, on this problem here, let's say that one of these CH3s, let's say this guy here was at like uh, 65, right? If I see in parentheses a Q, that means there's a quartet at 65. Now, it's hard to read when it's not decoupled, so this is usually, uh, this data has been processed more. But this tells me that, or I'm sorry, this tells me here that at 65, I have a quartet, I have a CH3. The N plus one rule will tell you how many hydrogens there are, right? Three hydrogens would give you a quartet. So in NMR, Split, if you are given splitting info, that is what it means. A quartet is a methyl, a triplet is a methylene, a doublet is a CH, and a singlet is a carbon, no hydrogens. So that can be really useful um, information to have. Uh, let's see. Okay, the... <laughs> 
two little topics we're going to end on. Um, let me say what I want to say first, and then we'll, we'll talk about this MRI image. So one chemical shift pattern that is not necessarily mentioned in this slideshow, but I think it is super important for you to know, has to do with the benzene ring. Now, if you have a mono-substituted benzene ring, you will know because you will have an integration of a signal of 5 somewhere between 7 and 8. If you have a di-substituted benzene, right, it's going to be integrated and you'll see 4 down in that 7 to 8. But how do you know if it's 1, 2, 1, 3, or 1, 4? If it is 1, 2 substitution, so let's say we have X and Y here. And if you have 1, 3, these will both be messy, right? We can call them multiplets. I would not be... A, I would not expect you to be able to determine between 1, 2, and 1, 3 substitution patterns. There's some argument about, you know, how this one would look versus others. You get some weird long-range coupling with aromatic rings. Just trust me, it's not going to be that easy to tell between 1, 2, and 1, 3. So if I gave you a problem and I wanted to know if it was one of these two, I would take either one. I wouldn't give you both of them as options in a multiple choice. However, if you have one four, I would expect you to be able to determine that. Because of this symmetry that is created when you have one four, you are still gonna get that integration at four. It's going to be between seven and eight, but it's going to be two signals. It's going to be two doublets, right? Because this hydrogen and this hydrogen are the same. They're HA and then HB and HB. And HB is only split by A and there's only one A that is its neighbor, right? It's not being split by this guy over here. It's being split by this one. And then this HB is being split by, you know, it's HA, this HB is being split by its neighbor. And so you wind up with two doublets, right? So one dub doublet that's two hydrogen, one doublet that's two hydrogen in that seven to eight region. I absolutely expect you to be able to determine if it is a one, four substitution pattern on a benzene ring. Now, again, there will be practice problems just for that purpose. So as I leave you off in chapter 15, let's talk about this image for just a minute. I think it's just important to know um, chemistry in the world around you sometimes. And this is just kind of a funny um, example to me. NMR is um, just like IR, just like mass spec. There are applications outside of organic chemistry, really important applications. Magnetic resonance imaging should sound familiar at this point, right? NMR is nuclear magnetic resonance. So at some point, they took the nuclear off of the MRI um, acronym. Uh, maybe it's a little too scary to climb into something that says nuclear on the side of it. But it is essentially an NMR. Um, it works a little bit differently. They, luckily, they don't spin you when you're inside of it, but there is a giant magnet. They are looking at um, the, they are essentially doing proton NMR, uh, but they're looking for concentrations of protons. Um, radio waves in the magnetic field are mild, and so no side effects should be experienced. But Again, it is in MRI. Okay, that is chapter 15. I hope at this point you realize practice is going to be crucial. You should be spending the weekend uh, or whatever day is following um, doing practice problems. I'm going to link you to many practice problems on the news 
uh, portion. So when you first go to the course page, I am going to give you links to extra practice problems and I'll be posting another video shortly of me working practice problem videos. Um, there are more practice problem video or more practice problems than you would ever have time to do. So I, I encourage you, I, I warn you, I, I celebrate you um, for doing as much practice as you can. And then come to me and we can talk through your, your problems. Okay. All right. Uh, the next.